respected uh, respected guests our brothers and sisters assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah um, before we begin inshallah uh, just a kind reminder to everyone that we are now going to be um, beginning with our main speeches so inshallah if you can all please um, be as quiet as you can i know it's hard with a lot of children here but inshallah uh, we would really hope inshallah if you can keep uh, the children under control and inshallah be um, as quiet as possible uh, and inshallah i've also been told now that uh, for the sisters with children uh, you can now use uh, an extra hall um, which is uh, at the back you can ask one of the sisters who they will guide you uh, you can take your children there as well inshallah there's um, tv access for you um, so if you have difficulties in controlling your children here yeah, you can take them to the hall inshallah there was a children program which is finished now uh, so you can um, keep your children there inshallah jazakallah khairan uh, moving on inshallah uh, we'll be beginning with our english speaker inshallah uh, this will be uh, our the speech will be delivered uh, by our respected uh, guest here ustad abu alia uh, i just want to give a quick introduction to our ustad here uh, before we begin inshallah uh, ustad abu alia is an imam author translator and director of the jawzia institute he has been involved in Islamic teaching, both in the UK and abroad since the late 1980s. Abu Alia has studied the Islamic sciences, theology, law and spirituality with a number of scholars over the last 20 years and still continues to do so. He has authored a number of books, including uh, some of the titles, More Fish Please, The Golden Rule of Deferring and The Exquisite Pearl, as well as translating books from Arabic to English. He has an MA in Islamic Studies, serves as an Imam for Iman Foundation in Good Mays, London, and has appeared on radio and TV. Some of his lectures and articles can be found uh, in the website thehumbleeye.com. Uh, so inshallah, if you have the opportunity, please visit this site to hear more lectures and speeches inshallah. Before we begin at this moment, uh, considering this is our 20th annual conference, uh, I think it's the right time to kind of reflect on our humble beginnings. I was told one evening in 1997, November 1997, uh, I may be too young to remember this, <laughs> um, but in November 1997, in one evening, some of our brothers and sisters gathered together uh, in a house to listen to a lecture delivered by none other than our Ustad here. Um, and this speech, straight after the speech inspired these brothers and sisters to form a community organization which we now know as the Islamic Dawah Center almost more than well, 20 years ago uh, you'll be aware as anyone here will know that over the years alhamdulillah we've had hundreds of speeches lectures classes and circles delivered by numerous and prominent dais and scholars from the UK and abroad but the first ever lecture that was delivered was by our Ustad Abu Ali here. His deed that day, which I'm not sure he realizes, led to the inception of our organization. And we, as we all know here, alhamdulillah, our Islamic Dawah Center has made a huge impact in the Tamil-speaking Muslim community, the Tamil-speaking Sri Lankan and Indian community here in the UK. And alhamdulillah, we've acted as a pioneer for other new organizations and groups to grow within this community in the UK. So and I, I think that it's appropriate now to kind of say that we owe our gratitude and thanks to Ustad Abu Ali here. His deed that day has benefited at least two generations so far and will inshallah benefit many more generations in the future. So on behalf of the Dawah Center, I would like to say to the Ustad here, Jazakallahu Khairan. And we pray Allah accepts your deed. And on that note, I think without further delay, um, I'd like to call our Ustad, inshallah, who will be addressing us on the topic of leaving a legacy. Inshallah. I didn't actually realize. So you want to box? Thank you. 
بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله وسلم وبارك على سيدنا وحبيبنا ونبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين أشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله أما بعد السلام عليكم ورحمة الله السلام عليكم ورحمة الله الله فيكم I know it's an incredibly hot day and uh, I'm already struggling to kind of manage with the heat uh, I'm thinking the jacket and the hat needs to come off but uh, I'm going to try to keep them on for just presentation's sake I actually didn't realize until uh, uh, young Akbar here who is, a, who is the son of a, a good friend of mine Mubarak uh, until Akbar has mentioned uh, the whole process I actually didn't realize uh, how the Islamic uh, Dawah Center started. I mean, I, I knew Brother Mubarak and one or two other brothers, uh, and I remember the Imam well, mashallah. May Allah SWT uh, bless the brothers and sisters and all of those who have been involved. Uh, it truly is uh, a, a fantastic task. When I saw that it's the 20th year, mashallah, that's something really great, alhamdulillah. Uh, and I know from other people. Actually, my parents are actually from South India. They just happened to come from Bangalore. So when my mother was young uh, and she was learning English, Urdu speaking, but she was learning English and other bits and pieces, uh, they had to pick up a little bit of Tamil uh, in those days uh, in, uh, in Bangalore. And the only word that my mum rem remembers, I think it's Tamil, I could be wrong, is the word for water. Apparently, is it Tamikur or something like this? That's all she remembers. Uh, so that's the level of my Tamil, the level of my mother's Tamil. Uh, other than that, it's all going to be English, inshallah. One more thing I'd like to say is, um, actually, even though, no doubt at all, those who help start a good thing, and my talk will be about this today, in fact, we'll have a number of talks about this today, it's not so much about starting. Sometimes starting something is not so difficult. But keeping it going, keeping it alive, functioning, and even growing, that's the difficult thing. So actually, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala greatly bless all of those who have been involved in this project. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala continue to give it uh, tawfiq, uh, grace, and benefit in the near future as well. Okay. Leaving a legacy, I was asked to speak about the end of a particular hadith, a hadith in, in Sahih Muslim, Sahih Bukhari, that has three parts. And I was told, Abu Ali, do the end third part. So I assume that before me, there will be two other speakers who will do part one and part two. But actually, I was told that I'm the first person. So I need for you to get your heads around this. I'll mention, that, I'll mention the hadith, or at least one version of the hadith, from Abu Hurairah anhu, that the Prophet wasallam said, إِذَا مَاتَ الْإِنسَانُ And it also is, إِذَا مَاتَ الْعَبْدُ إِنْ قَتَعَ عَنْهُ عَمْلُهُ إِلَّا مِنْ ثَلَاثَةٍ إِلَّا مِنْ صَدَقَةٍ جَارِيَةٍ أَوْ عِلْمٍ يُنْفَعَهُ بِهِ أَوْ وَلَدٍ صَالِهٍ يَدْعُ لَهُ the Prophet said that when a person passes away, when a person dies, his deeds come to an end, except for three deeds. Except for three deeds. An ongoing charity. Sadaqah Jariya. One. Or the second thing. Or a righteous child a righteous son or a daughter who prays for that parent. That's three. Sadaqa Jara, a recurring or ongoing charity. Beneficial knowledge that has been taught and spread. And a righteous offspring, a son or a daughter, or sons or daughter, daughters who pray for the good legacy of their parents. I'll focus on the last bit, but I'll quickly touch upon the first two bits very quickly. In another Sahih sound hadith, the Prophet said something similar. 
إن منا إن منا يلح يلحق المؤمن من عمله وحسناته بعد بعد موته. The Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم said, indeed amongst those deeds and good actions that will reach a believer after his death, that will reach a Muslim after his death, is علم علم علمه ونشره. One knowledge that is taught. And is spread. Well, or a pious child, a righteous child that is left behind, or mushafan, or rufahu, or that has been left as a legacy, as inheritance, or masjid and banahu, or a mosque that has been built by that person. Or a bait and ibn sabila banahu, or a traveler's lodge that someone has helped build, so travelers can benefit. Wa nahrun ajrahu, or a river or a stream that has been built or made to flow for the benefit of people. Or sadaqatun, or sadaqatun ajr, akhrajha min, or sadaqatun akhrajha min malih, fi sihhatihi wa hayati. All wealth that has been spent whilst a person is in good health and is living, benefit a person after their death. So there are things that a person can do in which Allah, out of His kindness, out of His rahmah, out of His lutf, out of His out of His karam, His kindness and and graciousness, helps a deceased benefit from. But there needs to be an ambition, an irada, in my life that I want to be a person who is a doer of good. I want to be a person who is investing for the everlasting afterlife. <coughs> I want to be a person about whom the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam described when he said, "Khayr al-nas anfa'hum lil-nas." The best of people are those who are of most benefit unto others. The Prophet ﷺ didn't say the best of people are those who have the thickest wallets. The best of people are those who have the most land or the most houses here and there. He didn't say the best of people are those who drive the fanciest cars, who have got the latest TVs and the latest mod cons. He didn't say the best of people are those who are the physically strongest or who have the most number of children or largest family. <coughs> he said the best of people, khairul nas, in this case, anfa'ahum lil nas, are those who benefit other people. That is to say, their Islam is not selfish, only concerned about their self, who cares about others. Their Islam is selfless. Not only benefit the, benefiting their own selves in their Islam and their worship of Allah, but their Islam themselves, they benefit others as well. They benefit others. Allah subhanahu wa taala, when describing Isa alayhi salam, Jesus son of Mary, peace upon them, in the Quran, describes Isa alayhi salam as being mubarak, being blessed wherever you are. And a Muslim tries to be blessed wherever they are, wherever of submitting to Allah, but they're also in a state of doing good to other people. So, sadaqa jariyah, very quickly, a recurring charity. So, for example, if I spend some money to build a hospital, or to print some Islamic books, or as this hadith mentions, I was part of the uh, the group that made this little river that runs to a village that helps them get water. Or help organisation. Any act of charity that continues to benefit people after after I have gone, for example, when the person passes away, whatever charity she or he may have done that people still benefit from, the deceased gets the reward of that. Bi idni la taala. What an investment! What a blessing from Allah subhanahu wa taala. All knowledge that has been taught and spread. And that is not just the ulama, the scholars teaching the non-scholars. That is parents teaching their children. 
That is mothers teaching their children. Anything, any knowledge that is pleasing to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and helps a human being understand their purpose of creation and how to connect to God. Any knowledge which is going to be beneficial in this life and in the hereafter, when that is taught, even after the death of the teacher, the person who it was taught to is acting upon it, is benefiting by it, therefore that benefit also goes to the person who has passed away. That's a second category of people. And then the third, the Prophet ﷺ said, all a righteous child or righteous children that are left behind who make dua for parents. Righteous children who make dua for parents. You know, uh, I don't know how it is in Sri Lanka. I mean, I vaguely recall going to uh, southern India, to, to Madras, and then into Sri Lanka around about 1997, 1998. Um, I, I can't remember much of how society was then. But in this country, when I was young, back in the 70s, generally schools, from infants to secondary school, generally schools, especially infant schools, pupils, kids were generally obedient, generally okay. I mean, they would do their naughtiness here and there, but generally as kids, we were all okay. My, old, my oldest daughter, she is now a primary school teacher in one of the schools in, uh, in East London, in one of the state schools in East London. She said that on her second, second day of term, uh, a young girl, so we're talking about an eight, seven, eight year old girl, picked up a chair and threw it at another teacher. And I said, wow, that's some serious young girl there. I mean, we've got young girls and boys having prizes here. Alhamdulillah, they didn't pick up a chair. <laughs> right. So she, uh, my, my daughter said to me, actually, that's not unusual. Things like that happen a lot in schools. And I was like, subhanAllah, that's a tough world. Okay, we're teachers now, you know, you can see one day that teachers are going to be coming in armed helmets and, you know, with shields and whatever, just to teach A, B, C, one, two, three, do, re, mi. SubhanAllah. <clears throat> so, it's very difficult now. Once upon a time, parents passed away, there was some level of religiosity, iman, Islam, in a person either because of the environment or themselves, they were eager and desirous to draw closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And society would, at the minimum, teach Muslim children when their parents pass away, make dua for them. Now and again, go to visit their grave. Make sure you try to keep friends with their friends, as occurs in the sunnah of the Prophet wasallam, to honor the friends of the deceased parents. Try to carry on their good legacy, whatever good they've done, try to increase it and continue it. Honor the name of your parents. This was a given in any Muslim society. This was a given, not in just Muslim societies, in most other societies that weren't even Muslims. But today, subhanAllah, it's a challenge. I don't think we can take it for granted that children we leave behind will necessarily pray for parents. I don't want you to despair, and I'm not saying it will not happen, it, does, it clearly does happen, and it happens a lot. But I'm saying to you, I'm suggesting to you, we may not be able to take it for granted that this continues to happen as a default Muslim practice with most Muslim families, whether they're quote-unquote practicing or not. At the moment here in the UK, all I have a friend, well I have many friends, but uh, I have one particular friend who's just come back from the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. He's, he's born Saudi, his parents Saudi, his grandparents born in the Kingdom. And he said, uh, and he's a, he's a teacher, a uh, very educated person. Uh, he came back and he said to me, uh, did you recently read that report that came out last year on uh, the, the, the state of religion in the Kingdom? I said, uh, yeah, I saw a report, but I didn't know whether to take it seriously or not. I didn't know if the, the statistics, the figures were authentic or not, and I never had a chance to chase it up. He said, well, I don't know what one you saw, but I'm telling you the one that we officially have in, you know, amongst us teachers, 
in the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, there has been a 10%, there, there are now about 10% of the population that say they are atheists. Not that they don't believe in Islam, they don't believe in Islam. Not that they don't believe in the Prophet they don't believe in the Prophet they don't even believe in God, in Allah. And that is not unique to the Kingdom. That happens a lot of places around the world. In the UK, the Muslims are not only the fastest growing community, religious community, but they're also the fastest losing Muslim community. Many, many people are becoming Muslim and we are having many, many children. That's our growth rate is not just to converts. It's also because uh, we still have quite a lot of children as well. But also the number of young men and women leaving the deen is also quite large. And we cannot just look at one side and ignore the other like it's some game that we can pat each other on the back with. That, oh, look what we are, we're the fastest growing religion. It was never about numbers. It was never about numbers. Allah Jalla Jalala who tells us that numbers means very little. If there's quantity but no quality, It's like scum or froth on the ocean waves. The Prophet described the Ummah as you'll be so many in number, you'll be so plentiful, like froth or that white foam on the ocean waves that has no significance because the waters just wash it away and it can't do anything. So we need to bear that in mind. So, a right, righteous children that make du'a. Children making du'a for their parents is one of the great things that benefit parents. Any good thing that parents have taught the children, especially about the deen, prayer, fasting, Qur'an, good manners, every time that child, that son or that daughter continues to act on it, there is a reward of that that goes to the parents even after their death. Allah grants them nur, the parents' light. Allah grants them uh, baraka, blessings. Allah grants them thawab, reward. Allah grants them an increase in daraja, an increase in status in His presence. Every time children act upon the good teachings that their, pro uh, that their parents have taught them. SubhanAllah. And I don't think it needs to be stressed that after the worship of Allah, the Qur'an is concerned with nothing more after the worship of Allah than be kind and dutiful to your parents. Now believe you me, the Allah knows <coughs> that some parents are not good. Allah knows many parents are good and He knows that some parents are not good. Allah knows that many parents look out for their children first and foremost and some parents don't care about anyone other than themselves. Allah knows that many parents, they look after the deen and the dunya of their children, give them a good worldly education, but also give them a good religious education. And there are some parents that just care for the, the worldly education because they're blinded and they're sufaha, they're fools. They think that getting their children into <coughs> Oxbridge or into some really good school or uni without teaching them worship of Allah, love of Allah, love of the Prophet some obedience to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, doing good unto others, repenting for sins, somehow that's going to make them successful. But you know what? Life is short and there is an eternal life to come. Such children who have been betrayed by their parents, such children, even though they have their own responsibility as well, when they reach a particular age, they too have an obligation to learn the teachings of Allah, the teachings of Islam. But parents will be asked, why did you betray your amana? Why did you betray the trust that I gave you in the form of parents? Did you think, O oh parents, 
that they were your own children, that you got them yourself, and I didn't give them to you? Did you not realize that I gave them to you as an amana, as a blessing, as a, as a test, as a, as a bounty, as a goodness? I know sometimes as parents when we look at our children we think, they're a blessing, <laughs> how can that be? But inshallah, they're a blessing. They're a, they're a blessing and they're a headache at the same time. Inshallah, Alex, all except a few. So, one of the things that uh, parents do is that make sure that we give them a sound education. But here's the thing, sound education. Ibn Khaldun, one of the great Muslim historians of the uh, 15th Islamic century, the 10th century Hijrah, roughly, 9th, 10th century Hijrah, which is around about the 15th, 16th century of the Common Era. He writes in his Muqaddama that in, in West Africa, this is how Muslim societies teach their children in the, when they're young. And in Spain, Andalus, this is how they teach their children. In Baghdad and the East, this is how they teach their children. In Africa, this is how they teach Muslim children. And he showed that the, the curriculum was slightly different depending upon what part of the world you came in. Some people gave emphasis on just purely memorizing Qur'an at the young age and don't teach them anything else. Some people said, no, teach them some Qur'an, but also teach them the sciences of the age, how to read and write, um, how to kind of basically uh, know when the sun sets and the sun rises, and, what, and by looking at the stars, what time of the month and the, uh, the, the moon, what time of the, uh, the month it is. And other people did other things. In this day and age, as parents, we need to ask this question, what is the best way to educate and give tarbiyah to our children, given their environment, given the state of the world today? Do I as a parent, with all my children, and each child is different, each child is like an individual flower. Individual flowers, they bloom and they blossom at different times. Individual flowers, this rose, for example, maybe, maybe in a few weeks, okay, from a seed, it blooms and you can smell and you can look at its beauty. And maybe this flower, it takes longer or shorter. Children are like that. Not all the children are the same. Some children, they start the race very quickly. And they don't get to the, they get to the finish line very slowly. Some children start from the uh, starting blocks very slowly. But Alhamdulillah, the last to start, the first to cross the finish line. We as parents are not looking for the short, thing, short term. We as parents are looking for the long term of our children, of the society. 20 years ago, when some brothers and sisters uh, sat down somewhere and said, how can we help the Muslim Tamil speaking, Sri Lankan Muslim community? They were that month, they were looking for a long-term thing. 20 years later, some of the fruits, samarat, are being produced. Young children are learning the Qur'an. Young children are, are confident in their Muslim identity in a post-9-11 world. Young children every day are falling in love with Islam, with the Qur'an, with the Prophet وسلم, with Allah Jalla Jalaluhu himself. Some children, as they grow old, grow, grow up, they... Hold on a minute. Why does this person, this uh, Muslim uh, girl or boy, young man or woman, behave like this? Why are they avoiding the drugs? Why are they avoiding... Uh, the, the so-called bad things in life which are now the exciting things in life and sooner or later that Muslim man or young Muslim man or girl will say it's my religion it's the way that Allah has taught us it's the way the process has taught us and for some non-Muslims it will make them think that's happening here in communities like this because people are looking for the long term the long term but it is about children. What is the best education? I couldn't tell you. My children are very different. They were very different and I, we could see that very, from a very young age. But what I would suggest is this. No doubt there is an issue of sending your children to Muslim schools. 
And no doubt there is a worry of sending our, our children to state schools because how much or how little Islam will they learn or will they get? Recent studies have shown anyone below 21, 22, 23, anyone, anyone below 24, say, young people get most of their Islamic knowledge or when they want Islamic knowledge, very few young people turn to their parents in this day and age. Either they turn to programs on TV, satellite TV, Islamic channels, or the internet. But the internet brings with it challenges. There is a few little drops of goodness there, and there is a whole lot of evil and misguidance there. And as children, as parents, we need to think what model are we going to use to raise our children? And this has nothing to do with the Sunnah, but I'm going to use the word traditional. Are we going to use more of a traditional way? The way of my parents' generation or my grandparents' generation, which is basically, oh children, shut up and listen and just do as you're told because I'm the boss. Well, anyone who's tried to use that method in this environment, in this day and age, will know that even if it worked nine, by the time they reach 11 or 12 secondary school, they don't want to know and they don't have to know. By the time they reach 16 or 18, they're well out of parents' hands. And not only that, did the Prophet وسلم, tell us to use violence on our children? Violence as in physically hitting and slapping them about and whatever. Which, by the way, is forbidden by the law uh, here. We need to think, hold on, what am I interested in my child becoming? I'll give you an example. In fact, there are so many of these examples, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's sad. So, there are some people who, here is a, here is a Muslim couple, Fatima and, and Bilal, and they've got a son. And Fatima and Bilal come to my house and, and they bring their son along, you know, eight, nine-year-old son. And their eight, nine-year-old son, he's memorized Juz Anna, right, Juz Tabarak. He's memorized the last two uh, sections of the Qur'an. He's now memorizing half of Surah Al-Baqarah. And then I think to my wife, I'm making this as, as an example, right? And then maybe I say to my wife, SubhanAllah, our son or daughter only knows the last ten surahs or just Surah Fatiha and Surah Qulhu Allahu Ahad. And then it becomes like a competition. We need to keep up with the Smiths and the Jones. Right? So now I'm pushing my son. Not for the sake of Allah, not for the sake of his betterment. But because the Smiths and the, the Muslim Smiths and the Jones, their young son or daughter is raw, is leap years ahead. And I'm pushing and pushing and pushing. So that, come the next dinner conversation, Come the next dinner conversation, my nafs, my ego, as a parent, my son, my daughter, he's memorized it. And actually we don't see, is that the way that helps them become strong Muslims connected to Allah and understanding the deen in the context of modern day life? I had a friend from, I had many friends, but one particular friend from the Islamic University of Medina that I was speaking to, he graduated with an MA in Sharia, okay, so in, in Islamic law from the Islamic University of Medina. And I was speaking to him about two weeks ago, and I said, you know, all this that you learned, all these technical things of Sharia and Fiqh and Usul that you learned, these fine details of Islamic law, now that you've been here for a year and a half, and now that Allah has blessed you with, you know, with a, 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 a child, how much of that are you applying? Can you apply? In your Friday sermons, what are the challenges that the congregation, the young boys and girls, or the young congregation has? 
Is it that they don't know the rules of ijtihad or qiyas, legal reasoning in Islam? Is it that they don't know? Or is it that they're not quite sure how to ch answer the challenges of modern science? They're not quite sure how to keep themselves firm against various temptations. Is it that they're not quite sure how strong and confident they should be voicing their Islam or not given a post 9-11 world and how society is becoming slowly and steadily more and more Islamophobic? Is it that they don't know what does Islam say about gender issues? That has science really answered the issue who created the universe? Has science really answered the issue of you know, we evolved from something other than Adam Islam being the father of humanity. These things are challenges that many, most young people at some level or the other face our, our talk. Some, non, some young Muslim Muslims, they use this method. They just plug their ears and they don't hear anything. But they, on the long run, they're probably not very beneficial to society. Some people, young people, listen to this and they get confused. And people like me, of this generation, 50 odd years old, I have no clue what's going on because I'm living in my own world as long as I'm doing my own thing. How can a parent or a Muslim scholar or a teacher be so oblivious to the needs of the younger generation? How can two scholars spend too much time about some fiqhi issue that has a benefit, some issue of law, Islamic law, that does have a benefit. Everything from the sharia, the sunnah of the Prophet even down to how should I clean my, my toes in wudu. It's all relevant. There is nothing of the sunnah of al-Mustafa, the Prophet the chosen one, that is irrelevant. Everything is relevant but they have priorities. Some things are more important than others, but all is important. So the children, the young people, the youths, they don't really want to listen to the khutbah of that maulana, of that sheikh, because he just prattles on. He's talking about something that is totally out of my life. And then we scratch our head and we wonder, how is it that we're being disconnected from the youths and the youths are drifting downstream? Muslim teachers in Muslim schools, probably, I'm, I'm suggesting this, I'm not saying that this is, this is not a fatwa, right? But Muslim teachers in Muslim schools are probably more relevant to the younger generation than any khatib or sheikh in a main mosque on a Friday because how many young people attend a Friday sermon and if they are there they're all at the back and they're not quite sure whether they want to take their eyes off their smartphone or not and they just want the sheikh to get on with it Muslim teachers therefore may be more important than parents used to be in uh, helping our children grow, helping young, young men and young Muslim me men and women grow. But Muslim teachers themselves need teaching. How many Muslim teachers have I come across and they couldn't tell you the main diseases of the soul because they haven't learnt much of that. They couldn't tell you that anything about self-knowledge, what did Allah tell us about the strengths and the weaknesses of the human being and how they connect to Allah? They couldn't tell you much. If they can't, if the teacher doesn't know, how can we teach others? Because given our children, we're rarely given our children outward rules, of course prayer, prayer is prayer, and we have a duty to encourage our children to pray from the age of seven. And by the age of 10, hopefully they're consistent. Not because by the age of 10 they will deeply understand their prayer, they will have khushu and khudu, they'll have focus and they'll have awe and they'll have um, humility in front of Allah. They probably won't until they carry on going. But it will become an ingrained habit. 
and the prayer is the first thing that we will be asked about after our shahada. The prayer is the first thing. But along with prayer, what about character? What about character? And here I want to just begin to round up. So what are we talking about? The Prophet said that three things will benefit a, a deceased person after they pass away. A sadaqa jariya, a recurring charity, beneficial knowledge, and righteous children that pray for them. And I am just asking this question, that it's not so easy to take righteousness for granted uh, anymore. It's not so easy. But we ask Allah for tawfiq and Allah is kind and merciful. I'm also saying that there is another issue here, which is what type of education as a parent do I want to give my children so that they can become righteous children making dua for me, praying for me? What type of child do I want? Do I want my son or daughter to have just hived the Quran, memorized the Quran when they're young, when they're 10, 11, khalas finish, and then I've done my job? No. This is probably more my own ego than it is for their benefit. I, I, don't, don't stop memorizing the Quran. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying that if I haven't given my young daughter or young son who, has, who is a half of or half of her, the tools of what your Islam means in, the, in today's world, so that when they go to secondary school, or when they go to do their A-levels, or they're in university, or they're in employment in the big wide world, they understand the context of their lives. They understand that, look, Allah created me for a wise purpose, to know Him and to worship Him. And how did Allah uh, want me to know Him? There are three ways that Allah, or two ways that Allah wants me to know Him. The first is the ayat of the Qur'an. Or actually the first is the signs around us in the creation. The signs in the sky, in the heavens, the signs in the water, the signs within us, how Allah created us. When someone sees, for example, if this was a, you know, like a red beautiful real rose, a person could look at that red beautiful real rose and say, Wow, that's so beautiful. And the rose is, the beauty of the rose is a reflection of Allah's absolute beauty because Allah created the rose. In everything Allah created, whether it's a rose, whether it's the snow, whether it's a tornado, whether it's a tsunami, some things inspire in our heart love and beauty. Wow, that's lovely. And it reminds us, Inna Allah Jamilun Yuhibbul Jamal. The Prophet said, Allah is beautiful and He loves beauty. Allah is beautiful. Bi zatihi, bi asma'ihi, wa sifatihi, wa af'alihi. Allah is beautiful in and of Himself. Allah's names are all beautiful. Allah's actions are all beautiful. Allah's attributes and qualities are all beautiful. And Allah wants us to be beautiful people. Not outward beautiful, not just outwardly beautiful, because the Prophet said, Inna Allah la yanduru ila ajsamikum, wa la ila suwarikum, wa la kin yanduru ila qulubikum wa a'malikum. The Prophet said, Allah doesn't look at your forms and your appearances. He really isn't that interested whether my parents are from Bangalore or your parents are from Sri Lanka, whether my parents are from Mauritania, West Africa, or my parents are from UAE, or my parents are from the East. They're not really interested in skin color or gender. Allah is interested in the heart and the actions of a person. Is the actions of a person beautiful in the way that Allah loves? Is the heart of the person, the things that are in the heart, beautiful, the things that Allah loves? Our scholars say, and if you don't remember anything, just remember this point. Our scholars say that if Islam can be summarized in one way, there's many ways to summarize Islam. One of the ways is, Islam is At-tahabbub ilallah bima yarda. At-tahabbub ilallah bima yarda. Islam is about becoming beloved to Allah by doing things that please Him. 
becoming beloved to Allah wanting to be loved by Allah how? not by having a Facebook post with a little icon of a heart an emoji I love Allah but actually bima yarda by doing deeds that are pleasing to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as young men and women that should be your aspiration it should be all of our aspirations so let me wind up with two or three points uh, in this beautiful beliefs beautiful actions anything that the Sharia teaches that the Quran and the Sunnah of the Prophet teaches it is beauty of course some things which are beautiful if you put them in the wrong place they become ugly not because they are ugly not because they are ugly in and of themselves they become ugly because I misplaced them sometimes young people find some things of Islam not nice because either quite often we misplace it misprioritize it or teach it in a wrong way we need to look out for the long-term future of our children especially with regard to their connection with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and as parents my last point is this about adab and parents if I'm going to show my children at a young age that actually all I'm interested in as a parent is that you go to madrasa you go to religious school after school on weekends you come to IDC they will get the sheikhs and the teachers and the maulanas and the mashayikh to teach you and I as the parent will just carry on watching cricket football whatever stupidity it is okay and actually my my actions speak louder than words I am telling you with my mouth son daughter Islam is very important but as for me as an elder as an adult I don't read the Quran daily or even weekly I couldn't tell you very much about what the Quran says I know more about cricket teams and smartphones and the economy and what Trump has done in his first hundred days than what the Prophet Sallallahu did in 23 years of his life alayhi salatu wassalam actions speak louder than words what will happen is the lisan al-hal will overcome the lisan al-maqal as the Arabs say actions will speak louder than words and the children at some point will think you know what it can't be that serious this Quran stuff this prayer stuff because mum and dad don't do it very much and then on the day of judgment if Allah forbids no the bilimin dalik our children have got in a habit of not being religious it will be their fault and, it, and, the, and the parents what will the parents say yeah but I gave you an iPad for your birthday I helped you to fill in the forms for Oxbridge I moved from Sri Lanka to good old London to have you influence in so many different ways so for parents as well as children the crucial thing is adab adab manners inward beauty outward character with Allah adab with Allah adab with the Prophet adab with other Muslims starting with the scholars the awliya and the, uh, and the ulama the scholars and the saints the, the elders our parents and relatives Muslims of our age Muslims younger than us adab adab with knowledge with religious knowledge don't ever use religious knowledge to beat someone with now I've got the religious knowledge I've learned some hadith, some fiqh I can argue with you and I can run rings around you Allah is not Allah hates that learning knowledge for other than the face of God adab with myself Allah created me a special creature لِتَعْلَمُوا لِنَعْبُدُ 
that we should worship Allah, know Him, journey to Him, and adab with the earth itself. We Muslims, not because there is a green peace, not because there is you know, a green party, not because it's the done thing today in the Western world to speak about green environmental issues, but because our Prophet ﷺ said, and fihi nadr, in this hadith, this hadith has some weakness in its chain, but the ma'na is sahih, that if you are by a, even if you are by a large a reservoir of water, even if you are by a large river, and you are making wudu, still do not waste water. Still do not waste water. In the hadith in Abu Dawood, Sahih hadith, the Prophet was traveling with some companions and they stopped for a rest. Then after the rest, the Prophet came to them and he noticed one bird flying in the sky and she's, she's uh, making lots of frantic noises. She's distressed. The mother bird is distressed and she's hovering around her nest. And the Prophet came and said, has anyone taken the eggs, the eggs of the, of the bird? And they said, yeah, I, said, yeah I, I, I just took one, right? I don't know whether, whether they were going to make an omelet with it or was it egg collection, I don't know, but they took it anyway. And it was not an, uh, not an unusual thing. It's not an unusual thing to do. And the Prophet said, put the egg back and don't distress the mother bird. In one narration, it says it was actually a, a small little chiclet. But don't distress the mother bird because there is an adab with Allah's creation. Even with, with the non-Muslim, there is an adab. We love the potential for good that they have in them. We want to be there to help them realize the potential to know and worship Allah that every human soul has been created with. And just like wise parents, when they see their son or daughter not listening to their advice and doing wrong things, wise, loving parents say, no problem. I will make dua to Allah that my children are guided aright and I will be patient. When they mess up their life, they will come to their dad, their loving mum, and we will be there for them. Those who have no Iman, those who are blinded to God, are like the infants who are going wrong in their life. Muslims, according to the Sunnah of Al Mustafa sallallahu alaihi wasallam, need to be those type of so-called parents that are saying, "Look, we're trying to do good to you. We're trying to guide you the right way. But if not, let us wait patiently." Many of these people, immersed in their kufr, chasing the dunya, forgetting their Creator making a mockery of Allah's earth, many of them will come to their senses sooner or later. But we have to be there holding out the medicine for them, the shifa for them, out of rahmah, out of pity and compassion. And many of them will drink that rahmah and will be guided bi idhnillah. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He give us tawfiq, grace to guide us uh, to, to walk out uh, the straight path for us and our children. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that He make our children fruitful and successful in this world and in the hereafter. Say Ameen, inshallah. Say Ameen. Let this not be uh, an, an ignorance that we don't know to say Ameen to any dua. Okay? We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that because it's not going to be me or you or the Islamic Dawah Academy. It's going to be Allah who opens up the hearts and sharpens the inward vision to journey to Him. And that's all we're asking. Ya Allah, let this work carry on and make it even better. Let the ulama not forsake this place and help guide us. Let the doers of good, the muhsinun here, spend even more time, money and effort making this place and this organization successful for the sake of Allah's creation to guide them to Him so that we can worship Him in love or in humility. Sorry about if I went over time. I actually lost track of time. Barakallahu feekum. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah.
Jazakallah uh, khair, Ustad, uh, for giving us that very beneficial and thought-provoking speech. Alhamdulillah. I think it's just a good reminder now, uh, just you know, picking up from uh, uh, the Ustad's speech on you know leaving a legacy, especially raising our children. Uh, as a reminder, we do have uh, classes and circles running uh, over the weekend uh, in our Dawah Center. Numerous classes. Uh, we have uh, children's Sunday study circles that run on Sunday morning. If you want further information, you can ask anyone. Inshallah, here around with the green jacket. Uh, and also, uh, we are open to your views. Uh, you know, if you have any things that you can offer f to us uh, as a Dawah Center to kind of take forward in terms of uh, improving our lessons, uh, we're more than welcome for your uh, views as well, inshallah. Uh, moving now, we have a 15 minute break until 6 o'clock, inshallah, uh, to pray Salatul Asr. Uh, just as a reminder, and I was told by the committee as well, and I think we should pick up on one of the uh, points that the Ustad made, uh, the last points he made in his speech about Adam. Uh, when you're doing, if you're going to do wudu in the toilets, uh, please do not waste the water. Uh, we don't want to create a flood uh, in 15 minutes time. So inshallah when you're doing wudu, please be considerate, please use just as amount of more, a small amount of water as you can. Do not let it flow over the sink. Um, and also, um, Please ensure, like if you can, wipe over your socks if you've already uh, done so in the morning. If not, inshallah, please do not cause a mess. Uh, so we have a 15 minute break, inshallah, now. Uh, we'll be resuming at 6 o'clock um, for uh, our next round of talks, inshallah. Jazakallah khair. <laughs>